Bohr's model of the atom. So before we get into that, particularly, we need to first understand what atomic spectrum is or emission spectrum. And essentially what this is, is light given off, emitted by heated gases, and they give off different colors of light. So the light that they are giving off, just like any other light, can be examined by looking at them with a spectroscope, a prism essentially, and the light goes in, it gets spread out into its constituent parts. And so if it's pure white light, it should give you a nice full rainbow. Um, but if it is um, other types of light, you can also analyze it as well. So another thing we should consider is where we are so far with our atomic model is that uh, we've gotten up to the Rutherford model. And again, his focus was on the nucleus. So he didn't really say much about the electrons, but sort of that they were there around the nucleus, um, kind of like moss around a light there's randomly about, or like a cloud around the, the uh, small, dense, positive nucleus. Um, however, this clearly doesn't work, and Rutherford knew this, but didn't have the answer as to how they do work. Um, but some of the things that are wrong with them being just anywhere around the nucleus are that if these electrons are constantly changing directions, they, they are accelerating. We know that accelerating charges give off energy. Um, and so if electrons were doing this, then the atoms themselves, as these electrons are constantly going around the nucleus, um, they should be giving off a continuous spectrum of energy. Um, and of course, if they're constantly losing energy, then eventually they wouldn't have any. So that's not good. So clearly Rutherford's model was missing a lot of information about the electrons. If those electrons were giving off a continuous amount of energy, then again, um, they should be giving off pure white light, which is how our eyes would see it. Um, and essentially what that is, is by blending the full rainbow, which has um, light of different wavelengths. And when they're combined together, they're white. And so if you put this into a prism, you spread it apart, you can actually see the different colors of light uh, within that white light. When you look at atoms that are heated up, this is not what is seen. What you do see is emission spectrum. And so if you were to take some sodium and have it in a gas form uh, and look at it, it's light that it's giving off is not the full rainbow. You do not see white light being given off by sodium gas. You see only, um, and you see this is actually old street lights that have that sort of orangish glow to them. They give off a particular type of light. And so if you analyze them with a spectrum, you spread that light out, you see just one particular band in the visible light spectrum. And there may be some taller ones, but that's the main one. Um, if you look at something like mercury, it has, again, the, the light given off by gaseous mercury is a different color than a sodium light because its emission spectra is different. Um, probably the bulbs in like most classrooms, um, they would be mercury fluorescent lights. And they're kind of more of a bluish color because they have a bunch of bands in the higher wavelength area and therefore that light is more of a blue color lithium different one hydrogen difference um, we, we can see xenon has a different one um, and so they all have these different emission spectra and the point being is that the light given off by different elements behaves in different ways and we can use that to actually analyze different elements and figure out what things are made of them quick side note emission spectra is the light being given off by a hot gas and, and, and is analyzed by a prism. If you were to pass white light through a cold gas, it would actually do the opposite. You get an absorption spectrum. So here's where Blair Bohr comes in. Um, so the Bohr-Rutherford model has the Rutherford nucleus to it, but the electrons, what they're doing and where they're placed, that's Bohr's work. And so he essentially came up with the planetary model. So Bohr theorized that an electron's energy is also quantized, taking that idea from Planck where um, energy can only exist in discrete amounts. Um, Bohr's applying this idea to the electron around the atom and say, okay, well, maybe these electrons can only have specific energies when they're around these atoms as well. And therefore you don't see them anywhere around the nucleus. You see them in specific spots. So the spectral lines, what they are, are the electrons moving from one energy level to another. Um, and therefore, depending on the arrangement of the electrons around the atom, they're going to be moving from different spots as you give them energy as they're heated up, and therefore they're going to be giving off different spectral lines. We'll see later when this is also going to be incorporated with the quantum model how this relates to waves. So if you imagine, um, probably 
drawn Bohr Rutherford models before. So we have our dense nucleus, that's the Rutherford part. So what Bohr was saying was, okay, if these electrons are around the nucleus, they may have these specific spots where they can be based on the amount of energy that they have. If you give them some energy, so let's say you, you um, heat them up or you hit them with a photon, they can exist where they were and go now to a new place on the atom or essentially a new energy level around the atom um, and essentially that would be the excited state the ground state would be the original state and they can then jumping is probably the wrong way to think of it because they don't actually exist anywhere between the two spots they are in the original spot and then they cease to exist there and then they are now in the new excited state and then if they wanted to get back down they would have to give off the energy they absorbed and they would now exist in the lower energy state. So they can jump back and forth between these lower and higher energy states by absorbing energy to jump higher and releasing energy to jump lower. So this relates to some work that was done by Mendeleev. Um, originally, when we were figuring out the elements, we essentially had a list of elements. Um, and you think, okay, well, that's kind of like having a list of letters, like just like our alphabet, which it's not a table, it's a list of letters. Um, however, what Mendeleev did was say, okay, well, instead of just having a list of these elements going from large to small, what he noticed was that there are some things about these elements that we see repeating periodically. And therefore, what we could do then is we could say, okay, well, helium and lithium kind of have some similar properties. So let's, let's put lithium below helium. Um, because they kind of act similarly in certain ways. And so then we'll, we'll instead of just trapping as a line, we can then start arranging it into a table. Um, and then if we go along, we say, okay, well, if we go along um, sodium, it kind of acts like lithium as well. So we can put it here. And so now we have our lithium and our sodium here. And then we keep going along down the list, checking out the properties, and eventually we get to potassium. And it's, oh, well, that's kind of like sodium. So we can put it down here. And essentially what we end up with, and to live, figure this out, was we have not a line, a list of elements, but we have a table. And this gives us our periodic table. His was based on the properties. However, why do they have those properties? So Bohr's model explains this. The periodic table is an explanation of the atomic structure. If you can see the table as the model, you've got it. So those energy levels that the electrons are moving between, um, they are then going to give those electrons certain properties in terms of how easy it is to gain or lose them, depending on which atom you're talking about. So essentially, the elements end up with the properties based on where their electrons are. So Bohr Rutherford model, great. We've got the nucleus figured out. We've got a place for these electrons. The placing of the electrons agrees with the periodic repetition that we saw with Mendeleev's uh, periodic table. Um, however, it's not like any model. Um, it is not perfect. Models show certain things about the reality itself. If they were to be a perfect representation of the reality, it wouldn't be a model. It'd be the thing. Um, and so there's always flaws to any model. So if we look at some of the flaws with the Bohr-Rutherford model, which will then cause us to want to have a more detailed model, um, we can look at something like the ionization energy. So if we look at periodic trends, we can see that ionization energy generally tends to increase across a period. So when you go from lithium over to neon, so across that second row, the second period, we can see the ionization energy increases. And then again, the third row from sodium over to argon, again, increase it. Generally, that's what's happening. However, we can see that it's not always the case. If we see that there is a drop between beryllium and boron, we see the same thing, a little bit hard to explain, between nitrogen and oxygen. But directly below the boron-beryllium drop, we see the drop again between magnesium and aluminum. So there's something going on in terms of what's being shown on the, the properties of it the ionization energy and we treat the second row and the third row as if they're all the same when we're drawing more rutherford to draw the nucleus the first um, shell the second shell when we go to put our eight electrons on there we treat them as if they're all the same but what ionization energy is saying is when you go from the second electron so lithium and beryllium that would be the second electron on the second shell one two three four um, when you go from that fourth to the fifth that fifth electron, its placement is a little bit different than the fourth electron that we had for 
uh, just brilliant. The same thing happens exactly again, but one period down. So there's something more going on than what the Bohr Rutherford model shows us. And atomic radii as well. Another problem is that we see that atomic radii um, is going to decrease across the period. We have um, a greater effective nuclear charge pulling those electrons in, leading to a higher ionization energy, also causing a smaller atomic radii. All that was great. However, when we look at our transition metals, that's not just eight across. They're actually going across by 10 elements. They're kind of all the same size. There's not a huge difference in their atomic radii as we go across that huge span of um, transition metals. So again, there's something affecting these properties here that's not really quite covered with the Bohr-Rutherford model. Not to mention, we probably wouldn't even be drawing Bohr-Rutherford models for the transition metals. This is why. It doesn't work great for elements past number 20.